As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Welcome to Home Group. My name is Rick Renner, and we've been waiting for you. And the we is me, Joel Renner, Maxime Masnikov, and Denise Renner. Let's begin by welcoming Denise. Hey, sweetie. Thank you. Welcome, Home Group. Are you loving this Home Group this week? I love what we're learning this week. And Denise, tonight we're going to get back to what you wanted to talk about two nights ago. We're going to talk about the shepherds tonight. Oh, the shepherds are amazing. Oh, they were the first evangelists. They were the first Maxime? I'm excited to be here. I know we're going to hear many interesting things. Looking forward to it. Joel? Well, I'm glad to be with you all. And if you guys want to see what we talked about in the previous nights, please go to our archive and look. I think you'll really enjoy it because we share details that I think are very interesting for the Christmas story. Things you've probably never heard before, but I think they're very, very good. I love the Christmas story because it is the ultimate story and it's a real story. This is not fiction. This is the truth. But guys, are you ready? Let's go back to the Christmas story. And I want to mention this. On our set, we have this little nativity figurine. It's been here every one of our home groups this week. And in this, we see Mary, we see Joseph, we see wise men, we see one shepherd, we see a little lamb, and we see baby Jesus. Were they all there that night? No, they were not. They were not. That's what you learn from greeting cards. <laughs> In fact, you're going to find out next week that the wise men came two years later. Two years later. The wise men did not come to Bethlehem. They went to Nazareth. I'm going to show that to you. But tonight, let's see who the shepherds are. Are you ready? Ready. ready. All right. <coughs> Around the hills of Bethlehem, there are a lot of caves. I've been in those caves. I have filmed in those caves. Maxime and I were recently in those caves. They're kind of hard to get to, but if you've got the nerve and the guts to do it, you can crawl over all the caves and the rocky places and get down into these caves. And that's where the shepherds used to stay with their sheep at night. And there was one particular cave which was nearer to Bethlehem, and that's where Jesus was born. The reason he was born in a cave, and I know that's revolutionary for people to hear that, is because there was no room in the inn. And they did not have an economic problem. It wasn't because they didn't have money. It's because by the time that Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem, all the places were already taken. Literally, there was no place for them to stay because the whole world was in movement because a worldwide census was being taken. And by the time they arrived, everybody else was already in all the available places to rent. And so they began to look for a place to stay and they moved into a cave and Jesus was born in a cave and it was identified early, early, early. Even Origen wrote that that is the cave where the light first appeared to man. I mean, this was really affirmed. But let's talk about these shepherds. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, that after Mary delivered the baby Jesus, after he was born, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. We have to remember that these shepherds were in the area around Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And near Bethlehem, to this very day, is a place called what? The shepherd's field. It was called the shepherd's field 2,000 years ago. That's where a lot of the caves are where you can go and you can see where the shepherds used to stay with their flocks. But it was called the shepherd's field 2,000 years ago. It is still called the shepherd's field today. Why is it called the shepherd's field? And why was this particular field and these particular shepherds and sheep so amazing, so important, that the angels appeared to them. Was there a reason why the angels appeared to these shepherds? Well, remember, everything God does is logical. This is very logical. Listen to this. In this field, sheep were being raised that would be used in temple sacrifice. So these were not just any sheep. These were sheep being raised for sacrifice in the temple, and they were set apart. 
They were consecrated from all other sheep because they were to be sacrificial lambs and they were already considered to be holy and sanctified unto the Lord. And the shepherds that were watching over them then were not just any shepherds, but they were a very special group of shepherds whose job was to watch over sacrificial lambs And in fact, they were so watching over them. The Greek says they were watching and watching. They were guarding and guarding. I mean, these were really special lambs because these were the lambs that were going to be used in sacrifice in the temple. They were constantly guarding these sheep that were to be used in temple sacrifices. And Luke 2 verse 9 says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Well, first of all, it says the angel of the Lord came upon them. Came upon, the Greek word, ephistomi, ay, ay, ay. The word ephistomi describes a sudden and surprising, glorious appearance that takes one off guard. So these shepherds are doing their job. They're in the shepherd's field. They're watching over the sacrificial lambs. Their eyes are on those lambs. They've got their eyes on the lambs. Suddenly, there's a beam of light that comes from the heavens. Ephistomy. A sudden glorious appearance. It looks like a beam of light suddenly shines down upon the shepherds. And the Bible says, lo, the angel of the Lord. The word lo is the Greek word. You do it means behold, wow, it is amazing. They were stunned by this. Suddenly, the abrupt arrival of these angels, this dazzling, dazzling sight as a beam of light shined down upon them. And the angel, there was just one angel at first, one, said unto them. This is Luke chapter 10, verses, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. But guess what? It says, behold, again, the Greek word, edu, which means, wow, 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 what I'm about to tell you is so amazing. This is amazing. Listen to this, guys. I bring you great tidings of great joy, which shall be unto all people. What you're about to hear is absolutely amazing. The Greek word, edu. And the angel then said, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, a Savior. What does that mean? A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The word Savior is a Greek word, soter. The word soter denotes Jesus' mission when he came to the earth. He came to be a Savior. This word soter means deliverer. Savior, healer, preserver, which means Jesus was manifested as a deliverer. Why? Because the human race was in sin. The human race was infiltrated by sin. It was under the captivity of Satan, but Jesus penetrated this earthly realm to bring deliverance. It can be translated Savior. He came to be the Savior. It can be translated Healer. He came to bring healing, preserver. He came to bring preserving power into our lives. Jesus came into this world for the sole purpose to set mankind free from the dominion of Satan's rule on earth. He was manifested as the great deliverer deliverer, and he came with saving power, delivering power, healing power, preserving power, and all of that power is still available for you. That's why he came. That's what Christmas is about. But the angel said it was Christ the Lord. The word Christ is a translation of the Greek word Christos. It means Christ or the anointed one. Jesus was anointed with delivering power, anointed with saving, anointed with healing, anointed with preserving power. And then it says, Christ the Lord. The word Lord is a translation of the Greek word kurios, which means the Lord or the absolute Lord of all. There's no power, no authority higher than this one. Jesus is the ultimate power in the entire universe. He truly is Lord over all. He rules supreme. And when Jesus was born, 
the angels miraculously said, wow, it is absolutely amazing. He do behold. It is stunning. Can you believe it? Do you understand how amazing this is that the Lord of all, the anointed one, the Savior has been born? Mm -hmm. And then the angels continued to say, and this shall be a sign unto you. This is Luke 2, verse 12. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Honey, do you remember hearing this story when you were a child? Of course. Do you remember hearing them saying, this will be a sign unto you? I can even remember quoting that because we were taught to memorize these verses. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. I was so proud I could say, this will be a sign unto you. Why was it a sign unto them? In effect, when it says unto you, the Greek is explicit. This will be a sign especially to you, which means it wouldn't have been a sign to everybody. But it was a sign to this particular group of shepherds. And who were these shepherds? <clears throat> the shepherds who were somebody? They were the shepherds who looked after the flock of the sheep that were offered in the temple. Or VIP shepherds. VIP shepherds who were protecting sacrificial lambs. So the angel says to you guys whose job is to protect sacrificial lambs, this will be a sign especially to you. So it was especially for them. You know, sometimes God will say something to you that makes sense only to you. It doesn't make sense to others, but it really makes sense to you. Well, the angels were saying... This is one for you guys. You guys are going to really understand this sign that I'm about to give you. Yes, Joel. Well, since Jesus, since the angels came to these shepherds, these VIP shepherds, like Maxime said, they were VIP shepherds. They were VIP. who watched after the sacrificial lambs that would be offered in the temple. Means, and they were elated. They were like amazed. They went out like screaming and yelling, looking for Jesus. That that's what that's how I read it. But it means like the next day when work continued in Bethlehem, right next to Jerusalem, they probably went to the temple and were like telling every, all their friends, all their colleagues, what happened that night. Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute, but let's go back to this sign. The word sign, this will be a sign unto you. The word sign denotes a sign that alerts a viewer to what he is saying. It means to document something, to verify something, to authenticate or to prove something. So it really meant, guys, when you see this, this will be the authentication, this will be the proof, this will be the documentation, the guarantee. When you see this, you're going to really understand. This will be a sign under you especially, under you guys. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The word find is even important because it is a Greek word. Heurisko, Maxim, what does heurisko mean? You really have to look. It's a hard work. You work and work and you look for it. And then when you find it, you're like, oh, I've done so much to find it. And that's Eureka. Where, Eureka. That's where we get the word Eureka. So when the angel said you will find the babe, it meant, first of all, they're going to have to go looking for this baby. Now, there's lots of caves around there. Jesus could have been born in any of them. But the use of this word find, the Greek word heurisko means these shepherds are going to take off and they're going to be going through these caves. We don't know how many caves they went through, but they were looking, 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 looking. They said, you'll know this baby because, wow, when you oh, see yeah. it, it's going to be a sign. You're going to understand. They were probably asking anybody they ran into, do you know where a baby was born? Was there a baby born tonight? I think there was a baby born. Do you know where that is? Do you hear screams of baby being born? I mean, they were probably looking and looking and looking. We even know how old the babe was because it is a Greek word, brephos, which describes a newborn. So this event occurred the very night Jesus was born, possibly minutes within Jesus' birth, hours within Jesus' birth, but it was the very night Jesus was born, probably within hours of his birth, and the confirming sign that the babe they would find was really Christ the Lord was that they would find him wrapped in Swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes. Anybody remember what swaddling clothes means, Denise? Swaddling clothes were the, the bandages that they wrapped the young little lambs that were for sacrifice. They wrapped their little legs around after they were born. And that would be a special sign to this to particular group of shepherds because their job was to watch over the little sacrificial lambs 
that would have very often been wrapped in swaddling clothes when they were born. And now the angel says, hey, guys, this will be a sign to you. And essentially, this is what it meant. The angel said, hey, guys, I know you take care of sacrificial lambs, but you've got your eyes on the wrong lambs. The real lamb of God has just been born in Bethlehem. And when you see him, you'll know it's him because he'll be dressed in swaddling clothes or he'll be dressed like a little lamb. This is a special sign, especially for you guys. Isn't that amazing? And imagine when they found him, found Jesus wrapped in swaddling clothes. They would have just been in awe. Yes. The angels just spoke to us. And here here is what they spoke to us about. This has to be the yes. God's God's son. Yes. And it's so odd that a baby would be wrapped in lamb's yeah. garments. I mean, the confirmation. It was the lamb of God that takes away this. It was such a sign, Joel. They were, the, what they heard was confirmed within hours of, of, of the angel's appearance. And the next day, they probably told the whole town what they had Well, saw. let's go on. Luke 2, 13 to 14. That's what we're going to read about. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. So up until this moment, it's been one angel doing all the talking. And then suddenly there was with that one angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. What in the world does that mean? That's what we're going to find out on Monday. Mm -hmm. What is that? A multitude of a heavenly host. I think you're going to be shocked when you find out praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, I don't want to shatter your imagination, but this verse never says they sing. In fact, in all of the Bible, there's not one place that ever says angels sing. Do they sing? I think they do. But the Bible doesn't tell us they sing. It says they announce, they repeat, they say. And here they began proclaiming. In fact, the verse says, praising God and saying. There's nothing about singing here. That's just what we have imagined. But they were saying glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And the Bible tells us in verse 15 and 17, this is what Joel keeps referring to. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. Well, Bethlehem was right there. I mean, it was just right there. This would have been very easy for them to do, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the brephos, the newborn, lying in a manger. And here's what Joel keeps referring to. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds, which means the very first evangelists to preach the gospel were these shepherds. The first evangelists were not theologically trained, but they preached because they had seen, they had heard, they had seen Christ. Joel? It says, all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Well, who is the all? It could have been the high priest. It could have been the governor. It could have been military men. It could have been other shepherds. It was all, everybody else who heard the story were astonished. I don't think people knew what to make of it, but they believed that, I think they believed the shepherds because the shepherds were very convincing. You know, Joel, you said, I don't know what they, they, they knew to make of it. And that's how the supernatural is in our life. We don't know what to make of it. It's, it's stunning. It's a marvel. It's a wonder. And that's, I mean, when God, God brings his supernatural power from heaven to earth, it, it makes you wonder. It makes you in awe. Hmm. And, and that's what those shepherds, I'm sure they were besides beside themselves. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they were going, did you see the swaddling clothes? Did you see the swaddling clothes? I saw the swaddling clothes. Have you ever seen a baby dressed like and a lamb? Swaddling clothes? Yeah, I'm sure they were just... It was a sign to it them. It was a sign to them. And but, think about it. The whole empire was in movement. And so people who had, would normally not be in that area heard the story of Jesus. I like that. That's good. It's just amazing mm. to me. And just a few days later, we'll talk about this, I'm sure... 
Jesus was dedicated in the temple. Oh, yeah, we'll come into that. And we'll talk about it. But think about it. Just a few days earlier, these shepherds who are, I'm, I'm sure they're talkative people, but they, they just do really weird things. They start talking about angels appearing and a baby being born. And then just a few days later, Jesus comes to the temple and there's prophecy being given. There's more commotion about that. I think when Jesus was born, the world started talking. And Luke 2.19 says, But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. But, hey, guys, I see a major problem in this story. Anybody else see the problem? Where are the wise men? There's no wise men here. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, there are no wise men. There are no wise men. They're not here. They're shepherds. They're angels. There's Mary and Joseph. But there's no wise men here. Where are the wise men? You're going to find out next week where the wise men are. But let's go on. It says, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The word kept means to treasure. She treasured it. Of course she did. She's been through quite an amazing nine months. An angel appeared to her. She was with her, with her cousin who had John. John the Baptist. Now she's had this baby. The angels, shepherds. She kept all these things. It means to keep a priceless possession. You know, you need to really keep and treasure the things that God has done in your life. In fact, she kept them so much that it goes on to say in verse 19, she pondered them in her heart. You know what the word pondered means? It literally means to keep in perfect order, which means Mary kept an internal journal about all of these things. Mm. The events, the chronology of these events. And years and years and years later, toward the end of her life, when she was living in Ephesus, and she moved to Ephesus because John moved to Ephesus. When the apostle Paul was killed, John became the presiding bishop of all the churches in Asia. And when he moved to that area, he brought Mary with him. And history tells us that when Mary was living in Ephesus, she was visited by a lot of apostles. Of course, they knew her for years and years and years. And Luke interviewed Mary. That's one reason why we have such an amazing account about the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Luke sat with Mary and interviewed her. Well, she had pondered all these things in her heart. She had kept an internal journal about the events, the chronology of these events. She kept it all in order. That's really what it meant. And so when she sat down with Luke, she point by point began to walk Luke through the whole story. Wouldn't that have been a privilege to be Luke and to be interviewing the Virgin Mary in the city of Ephesus? What an amazing thing. But because Mary pondered all these things in her heart and she kept them in order chronologically, she had an internal journal. She was able to share all of these events with Luke, who was an amazing writer, and he documented it all. But what is the multitude of the heavenly host and where in the world are the wise men? We're going to find out next week. Let us know what you think about Home Group this week. Go online, give us your comments, and if you have a prayer request, call us 1-800-742-5593 or write us at prayer at renner.org. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Bye-bye. Hey, friends, this is Rick Renner, and I have a big announcement, so pay attention. Starting in January, Home Group will only be Saturday nights. We've decided to really focus on Saturday nights. We want to bring you the very best, but we want you to join us. Every other night of the week, we're going to replay our regular daily TV program, except Sunday night. And Sunday night, we're going to have what's called Teaching of the Month. It's going to really be good. But Home Group will be Saturday night. So please write that down. And don't forget, Home Group is moving to once a week on Saturday nights. And we'll be waiting for you right here. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.